Good morning. Welcome to Central Pampa's Drive-In Church again this morning. We are blessed to be able to get together, even though we're staying separate. So, let's sing together. He keeps me singing. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee, peace be still. In all of life's ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Soon he's coming back to welcome me, far beyond the starry sky. I shall wing my flights to worlds unknown. I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. And I hope he's keeping you singing this week. The Lord has been good to us. We're glad that you're a part of us today. Thank you for being here. And thank you for sharing this time with us. Of course, we all understand we can't do this without the wind blowing, but that's the way it is. But it's a joy to be here, and it's, it's good to have you uh, in our parking lot uh, this morning, and many of you at home listening by radio and on Facebook. And we appreciate you uh, taking the time to do that. It's going to be a great day in the Lord. And let me just share with you uh, a couple of things before, I, before we pray. We don't know anything beyond April 30th. We know what we can do till April 30th. Uh, the governor is supposed to give direction uh, on the 30th, I believe it is, and then he'll tell us what we can do. Now, if, if for whatever reason they open the, the churches and say, okay, you can meet together, we're still going to have to do the social distancing, and we understand that. We know that. But let me say this. I know that there are many of you that say, really, that, that can't. I, ju I just can't come do that uh, till all of this really just settles down. And I want you to know we understand that. We don't want you to, to do that. There are some that uh, need to stay away and need to make sure that uh, they don't get in contact uh, with this virus. We understand that. And we want you to stay away, stay at home, uh, and take care of yourself. And because I really believe that soon God's going to open all this up and, and we're going to be able to get together again. So if we do open up, we'll be on Facebook, we'll be on the radio, we'll be in the auditorium, uh, we'll be distanced, uh, and we'll decide on can we have Sunday school and church or what are we going to do. Uh, but we'll make all those decisions. We'll see uh, how this will all work for us, uh, and then we'll go from there. So you pray that God will open that door for us and that God will bless us uh, where we can come back together. But keep in mind, uh, we understand if, it's, if you're just not comfortable with being together with a crowd, we understand that. So you just take care of yourself, uh, and we'll make sure that we keep uh, sharing the word and, and uh, hopefully keeping in touch with you uh, throughout the week. Uh, God has truly blessed us, and, and I'm so thankful for you, and I'm thankful for all of you that are here today, that are here to worship with us. And I hope that you'll invite somebody, invite them to come and be a part of our, our drive-in church. Uh, if they would like to do that, we would love to have any that wanted to. Uh, we've got plenty of room, uh, so you invite others to come and uh, share this time with us. Let me share some prayer requests with you that uh, we need to keep on our hearts as, as we pray. Uh, don't forget Clarine Cochran. Clarine had her hip repaired this past week in our hospital. Uh, she's uh, been moved to Coronado Nursing Center uh, for rehab. But you keep Clarine in your prayers and uh, keep praying for her and her, her rehab. Floyd Larkin uh, is in um, Amarillo uh, at the Arbors for rehab. And we're just praying that she can get stronger and be back home. So you keep Floyd in your prayers. Uh, Francis Connor uh, spent... 
uh, last weekend and, and part of this past week in the hospital. But she is at home now. They diagnosed her with an ulcer. And so they're treating that, and uh, you pray that the Lord will continue uh, to bless and, and to minister to her. Penny and Nate Harvey. Uh, this Penny is uh, James and Dana Greer's uh, daughter and her husband, Nate. Nate works at the prison, and both of them uh, were diagnosed with uh, COVID-19. But they are at home. They're recovering, uh, and uh, they are doing well uh, in their recovery. There are two little children that they were going to adopt. Uh, so far, they test negative, and that's good. So you keep pay, uh, Nate and Penny in your prayers and uh, keep lifting them to the Lord and just trusting and believing God that he's going to heal uh, this virus from our nation and from our world. And I believe that, and I hope that you do as well. But it's all got to be done by him. And so we're going to uh, give God the glory and praise him for that. Join your hearts with me. Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege of worship. We thank you, Father, for your grace that is sufficient. We thank you, Father, for your goodness. We pray, Father, that you would minister to the hearts of your people. Father, I ask you that you stir our hearts in, in a special way today, that we feel and know your presence, and that, Father, we understand uh, our need for you, especially in a time like this. We pray for Clarine Cochran, for healing and strength for her. For Francis Connor, Father, that you would heal and strengthen. And, uh, Father, for Floyd Larkin, uh, continue to be near her and strengthen her. Uh, Father, I, I pray for Penny and Nate. I pray, Lord, that you would heal them from this virus, protect their home, protect their families, Father. And we ask, Lord, that you just remove this from them. And, Lord, I pray that you cover all of our city, our nation. Father, I pray for our state. I ask, Lord, that you just shadow us uh, in your mercy and your mighty uh, grace and goodness. Father, that you protect us from this virus. Father, protect everyone. Uh, Lord, uh, in our churches and, uh, Father, those who gather, Father, may you just keep your hand upon us. Heal us, O God, and deliver us. Father, we truly have sinned, and we acknowledge that sin. We ask for your forgiveness, Lord, and we ask, Father, that you, with all glory and might and power, Father, that you would deliver our nation, that you would heal us. Father, heal us spiritually, heal us physically. Lord, that we can once again return to worshiping, but Father, that we would turn our eyes back to you and center on who you are. And so, Father, I pray that you bless this time together today. We thank you, Father, for uh, the privilege of serving you today. Ask, Lord, that you minister to us, that you bless us, that you keep us in your care. Father, we love you. We thank you. Sing through us. Speak to our hearts, O oh God, as we open your word. May Jesus be exalted, and may you be glorified. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. One thing we know in all this, no matter what goes on, we have a friend in Jesus. We're going to sing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, Revive Us Again in Victory in Jesus. So let's sing. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. We praise thee, O God, for the
the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. <clears throat> Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groanings, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He plunged me in with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him. And all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory with his redeeming blood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day i'll sing up there the song of victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Aren't you glad we have victory in Jesus today? This is going to be kind of a, got to hang on to this stand and hang on to the microphone and hang on to my Bible. And so you folks just hang on and we'll see if we can get this done. I want you to take your Bible and join me in Luke chapter 15. Now the passage of scripture is going to be very familiar to you, but take your Bible, your phone, your iPad, whatever it is you have with you and turn to Luke chapter 15. You know, all of us have been contemplating and asking just exactly why God allows all of this. What, what is it that maybe is going on in the world, or, or why does God uh, allow all of this to, to continue when we know that God's got the power to overcome, God's got the power to heal, God's got the power to uh, take all of this away. We know that, we realize that, and yet this, this continues. 
Now, we see things happening that indicate to us that maybe this is lessening itself, and, and before long we'll get back to what we call normal. And that, I've, I've heard that word over and over and over again. We want to get back to normal. And then you have to ask yourself, what is normal? And you say, well, I want to get back to doing what I was always doing and basically saying I want to do it the same way that I was always doing. So as we ask ourselves that question, why, why does God allow this? To me, I, I think that we must look back at ourselves because we have to look at our part in this. Why is God allowing this? Why is God allowing our churches to be closed? We can get together like this or we can do certain things over social media, but we can't meet together. Why is that happening? Why, why? And the question goes on and on. And we look at God and we say, okay, God, why don't you just do something about all of this? But have you ever given a thought to the fact that maybe God looks back down at us and says, why don't you do something about this? That's what I've been struggling with this week, thinking about what's my part in this? What, what if uh, it, it belongs to me? And I wondered, could it be that God wants our world and our nation and our churches and his people to return to him. He created this world and he gave us this country that we live in. God is the one that brought us over here and God is the one that, that allowed us to be in the greatest nation in the world. And, and could it be now that as we look at this, that God wants us to return to him and come back to him? Now there's no doubt and you'll all agree with me on this. We've pushed God away in our nation. We, we've pushed him to the side, and we've told him that we will do what we want to do. It's not up to you. It's not what you want. It's what we want. We make truth what we want truth to be, and we go about doing what we want to do and bring God in when we think everything is going wrong and we need some help along the way. And you say, well, if there's things that I'm doing, God is still with me. Yes, He is. Will God ever leave His children? No. Will God ever forsake us? No. He told us that. Will God ever test us? Yes, He will. Could we be in this testing phase right now to examine who we are? Where am I? What am I doing? Where is my normal? And what is normalcy to, to all of us? Now, James says in, in the first chapter of James, uh, Brethren, count it all joy when we have temptations that come our way. Joy. Because it teaches us to pray in faith. It teaches us patience. But the only way that we can find that is by wisdom. And James says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask it of God. And that's where we are today. We have to ask God for wisdom so that we can and look in our lives and we will admit that there are some things in my life that need to change so that God can begin to work and God begins to move. And as God begins to work and move in us, then we're going to see things begin to happen for the glory of God, and that's what he's after. I believe that with all of my heart. I do not, I do not pretend to know the mind of God. I will not go there. I don't know. I cannot get that high. I can't understand his mind. But I know his heart. I know his word, and so do you. You know Christ. You know his heart. That's God's heart. Christ revealed that heart to us. Now his mind, what God's thinking, how God is working, we don't actually know. But I do know this. You remember back in Jeremiah? When Jeremiah got, uh, records to us that God said, I know the plans that I have for you. Remember that? Did you notice he didn't say, I know the problems that I have for you? These problems will come no matter who we are. Problems are going to arise. Problems are going to take place. We're going to find things like this, and we have to do something. And so I think we have to begin today by examining just exactly who we are and then understanding who we are in Christ and what God wants us to do today. I really believe with all of my heart 
that God is trying to awaken this nation to get us back to where we ought to be and not go back to the normal of just doing it when we feel like doing something or giving when we feel like giving or serving when we feel like serving. God wants us to get back to an awakening within our hearts and our minds and realize He is God. We are to worship Him, and we are to focus our attention on the service that we have for Him. He wants us to go and do what He has us to do. I can't think of a better scripture than the prodigal son as an example of this. And I want you to read with me uh, in, in verse uh, 12 and 13 about the prodigal son. And we'll look at some more verses here. But let's begin with uh, 12 and 13. And the younger of them, this man having two sons, said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls. And he divided unto him his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, took his journey into a far country, and wasted his substance with riotous living. You know, we've learned some new phrases uh, during this time. We all have all learned, and I never heard this before, uh, you may have, we all learned a phrase called social distancing. Now, what we've learned is, is that uh, to keep this virus down, we need to stay at least six feet apart from each other. When we're in a grocery store or in Walmart or if we're out, we need to stay six feet away from each other. And the only way we can get out is to take care of the essential things of our life. We need to go to the grocery store. We can do that or whatever it might be. But let me ask you a question. We've learned social distancing, but in our normal walk of life, don't you think that we have taken spiritual distancing from God just a little too far? And that's what, ha that's what happened to the prodigal son. And, folks, I really believe that's what's happening to you and I today. This son, when he said, Father, give me my, my inheritance, what's coming to me, that was his right. He could do that. And then he took it and he went into this far country and he wasted it is what the Scripture said. When that happened, the thing that affected this the most is that he separated from a relationship with his father. You see, the story of the prodigal son is not about the prodigal son, and it's not about the older son. It's about God, the father. And what this son did was is that he moved from a relationship with his father. He got all of this money coming to him. He got the freedom that he wanted. And then he wanted to change everything. He wanted to get as far away from the father's house as he could. And that way he wouldn't have to fall in under all of the rules that he had in the father's house. He knew that his father loved him. He knew that he had everything that he needed. But he just couldn't take the rules anymore. His daddy always made him go to church. He always had to go to Sunday school. He had to go to church. He always had to be there, and he didn't want to do that anymore. Nobody else is doing that. Everybody else is doing it different. Different. Everybody else is changing, and that's what we want to do. We want to change everything up and be like everybody else. And yet the father just maintained who he was and stayed just exactly who he was. And then you can't help but think that this younger brother didn't like his older brother. His older brother picked on him. His older brother bossed him around. His older brother did this and that and the other. And so he really didn't love him anymore. There was not the love among the family. The, the, the relationship that he had with his father, he wanted to pull away from all of that. Isn't that what happened in the church? We pulled away from God so that we can be like everybody else. Just because everybody else is, is doing certain things and, and doing it in a different way because that's supposed to fit in with, with everybody that uh, is in our nation today. Everybody else is doing that. And here his father is doing everything just the old-fashioned way. He began to drift from him, drift away from him. And he saw a way that he could just walk away and separate himself from that relationship with the father. Sometimes I think that we, if we look back in our lives, we really think God is too strict on us. God doesn't want us to have fun. 
Folks, there's not a greater joy in your life than to know that I have a home in heaven when I leave this earth. There's not a greater peace that you'll ever have to know that if something happens, that I'm going to have a place in heaven with God, and I'm going to see Jesus, and I'm going to spend my life with Him. And I don't have to do uh, real uh, try to make things different. God is who He is. He is always God. He never changes. Christ is always who He is. He never changes. He gives us the instructions that we need. He's not too strict. He wants us to live according to His will so that we can bring glory to Him and that all things will work for good for us. Maybe we've distanced ourselves spiritually a little bit too far away from God. You know, the church, I think, is like this young son. We slowly, gradually pull ourselves away from God, pull ourselves away from His Word. We hear people saying, well, uh, the Word doesn't really mean that. We can, we can look at it like this. He didn't really, God didn't really mean that when he said that. God meant this. God didn't mean that, that uh, uh, people weren't supposed to love each other of the same sex. He really means this. We're supposed to love everybody. And we've taken that scripture and we've twisted it and turned it and, and made it something that it's not. We've tried to make ourselves into something that we're not supposed to be. You've been called by God to be who you are. I've been called by God to be who I am. And, folks, it's not for us to distance ourselves from God and decide what we think is better for us. We've got to keep our eyes on God. Now, I read back in Joshua. There's some great verses in Joshua to encourage you through all of this. But back in Joshua chapter 3, when they were going to cross the Jordan into the promised land, they were going to take the ark across, and Joshua told them, he said, don't you come within a half a mile of that ark. You stay back from it. We remember when David brought the ark back, and they were carrying it on a cart, which they weren't supposed to do in the first place. They were doing it like they wanted it. And as the cart hit a hole and rocked, there was a man by the name of Uzzah that was walking beside the cart. He reached up to steady the ark to keep it from falling, and God dropped him dead right there. Stay away from that. You don't touch that. That's not for you. Remember Moses when he went up on the mount in Sinai so that he could uh, get the law from God. God said, you keep everybody away from this mountain. Don't let them touch it. Don't let them get close to it. You keep them all away from it because if they come up here, they'll die. He's a holy God. You can't see him, can't touch him, and he's holy. So you make sure that you keep everybody away from here. You say, okay, if, we're, if those people are supposed to stay that far away from God, then why are we supposed to stay that far away from God? Why is it that we need to be so close to God? Let me tell you something. The distance that he was talking about there in the Old Testament, talking about the ark and talking about uh, the, the mount where Moses was, the distance is for reverence to God, not to rebel against God. And when Joshua brought the children of Israel over to the promised land, once they got in the promised land, they began to try to be like everybody else. They began to try to live like they did. They wanted to intermarry with them. And that's what brought part of this problem on uh, with God bringing those people under judgment. They tried to make their gods uh, a god like the God of heaven, and that's not going to work. We are to reverence God. But we are to draw close to God because Jesus has torn the veil and covered us in the blood. And by that blood, you and I can stand in the presence of a holy God. He wants to embrace us. He wants to love us. He wants us near Him. And the more that we rebel in walking away, doing our own thing, making it our own, trying to be what we're not, dear friend, we are distancing spiritually away from God, and God is trying His best to bring us back to Him. We don't need any other gods. We have the God of heaven. Don't change Him. Don't try to change yourself. Let God be God, and you be who God wants you to be. Now, this young son complained about all that he had. But did you ever notice something about this? He went in, and he made friends there, and he said, I have everything that I need at home, but i got to get away from this. And when he did, he went and joined himself to those that had absolutely nothing. 
we're, we've got popular religious programming and preachers in our nation today that are making millions of dollars for themselves speaking about things that are not biblical and truthful. And people are following after them because they're not challenged to serve. They're not uh, challenged to live. They're not challenged to witness. They're not challenged to share. And they're following after them because it makes them feel so good. Folks, worship is not about feeling good. Worship is about us drawing close to God. And as you sit here today, and I stand here today, it is for me and you to draw ourselves close to God. In verse 13, the Scripture says that he wasted his resources. Everything that he had, he wasted it. And when we begin to distance ourselves from God, all of a sudden the gifts that we had are wasted. The talents that God has given, they're wasted. All of these things are just atrophying in our lives. Wasting because we're not placing them where they actually belong. Where we distance ourselves, we've distanced ourselves in praying. I've challenged us over the, the time that we've been apart, uh, having to do our church like this, to pray three times a day. Psalms 55, 17, evening, morning, and noon will I pray, the psalmist said. Daniel, when he was in, the up, in his upper chamber where he lived, every day, three times a day, he opened the windows toward Jerusalem because that was his hometown. And he knew that that's where God did, had dwelt and where God wanted to, wanted to dwell. And he wanted to get back there. He wanted his people to be safe. And three times a day, Daniel fell on his knees and he prayed. We've gotten away from spending time alone with God. We've gotten away from taking time within our busy schedule to just stop for a moment and give him praise and glory and to adore him and to praise him and to thank him. We've gotten away from the fact that we have the privilege to be in the presence of a holy God, and yet we don't take advantage of that. We spend our time worrying. We spend our time in fear. We spend our time fretting. We spend our time uh, separated from the holy God who gave us everything that he wanted, and we waste it. We waste the will of God. God has something very special for your life. He wants you to fulfill it, and what God wants you to do, I can't do. And what God wants me to do, you can't do. We've got a part of God's will. And he said, this is your purpose, uh, my purpose for your life. And we waste it when we drift away from God, looking for something new, looking for something different, and trying to make uh, what, who God is something that he's actually not. We've wasted his word. We've changed it up. We've changed it in so many ways. It doesn't say that. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't do that. Let me tell you something. Well, let's be honest with ourselves. God said what he meant, and he means what he says. What he said is true, and everything that he's told us is true. Everything in this book is true, and we have to do that. Don't get away from the word. Don't try to find something that is, is just going to be different for a little while because you'll find yourself wasting away. And that's just exactly what's happening uh, with this prodigal son. And he faced a dilemma. He said, well, here I am, and I have absolutely nothing. And I know that my father is, is uh, somewhere, but I don't know where he is, and I don't know why he doesn't come get me. I don't know why he doesn't take this virus away. I don't know why he doesn't open our churches back up. Where is my father? He's at his house. He's waiting for us. He's not going to leave us. But we have the freedom. And we use that freedom in a way that it should not be used. It's not a freedom for us to do what we want to do and live like we want to live. It's a freedom to obey and follow Almighty God. That's what the freedom is all about. And this young man, I believe, is crying out. And in verse 14, he says he spent all there, uh, after he spent everything, there arose a famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Here he's joined with this other, and all of a sudden he's totally ashamed because what he thought was what he wanted had nothing at all for him. That's the same way with me and you. We've distanced ourselves, and we're ashamed. It's time for God's people to get on their knees and say, Dear God, I'm ashamed. Ezra did it. Daniel did it. 
I, th I think that God is waiting for His people in this earth today, His people, to get on their faces before Him and confess, Lord, I have wandered away. I'm coming back. There's nothing else out there for me. All I need is you. Folks, I think we've taken our spiritual distancing a little too far and wandered away from God. But there's another phrase that we've learned. Let me share it with you right quick. First time I'd ever heard this, too. And, it's, and uh, the governor got on and, and said, we will shelter in place. Well, I didn't really know what all that meant, but I, I finally understood uh, that he meant to stay where your bed is. And that's what sheltering in place is. You stay where your bed is. My bed's there. That's where I stay. And so we're supposed to stay home and stay inside, sheltering in place. But I really believe that as we have spiritually distanced ourselves too far from God and, waste, and are wasting what we have, we are also sheltering in the wrong place. That's what happened to this young man. He found himself with these other people, and, and he joined himself uh, with, with them. And he had all the comforts at home, and yet he had no comforts. The drought set in. He had no money. All of his so-called friends had taken it from him. There he was thinking he had everything that uh, he wanted, and he wanted to be this, and he wanted to be that. So I'll make a different shelter. Then he found out that that shelter did not provide the needs that he had. He thought this shelter would be more fun, not as strict. This shelter is going to be a great place to be because everybody just acts the same way and does the same things, and nobody tries to tell them this is right and this is wrong, this is good and this is bad. It's all just as good as we want it to be. All of his friends are gone. The shelter that he had has dwindled to a shanty, and there he sits, and he has nothing. There's no fun. There's nothing at all. We're sheltering in a place where God doesn't dwell. We have pulled ourselves away from the relationship with the Father to try to gain something that's really not there or something that is empty. But then when we try to make another shelter fit us, it's not going to fit. I couldn't go over to your house and, and shelter there. I don't know where anything is. I wouldn't want to do anything at your house, and you wouldn't at mine. We need to shelter where we are. And, folks, the greatest shelter that we have, we found out, is Almighty God. You see, what this, this young man wanted to do was use his father for his needs. So his father met the need. But then all of a sudden he said, my father's not around, and that's because he went to the wrong shelter. Here's what happens. When we shelter in the wrong place, the foundation begins to crumble around us. He began to be in want, he said. There's a famine in the land. He, want, he was in want. He joined himself to a citizen of that far country, and he sent him in the field to feed the hogs. Wouldn't you like to see a Jewish boy slopping hogs every morning? That's not where he was supposed to be. And when the foundation begins to crumble under where we're sheltering away from God, have you ever noticed that we look up and there's not a shepherd to lead us? Where is the shepherd? Where is the shepherd that will lead us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake? Have you ever noticed that when we shelter in the wrong place, uh, that we don't uh, have uh, the food that we need to eat? We find ourselves hungry, wanting. And I'm not talking about physical hunger. You know, as long as I've been sheltering in place, and you can't really go and get anything or go sit somewhere and eat, we've been cooking, and my goodness... Have we been cooking? And if she's going to cook it, I'm going to eat it. And I eat it, and then I keep eating it, and I eat it again. But we don't have the spiritual food that we need. We have pulled ourselves into a place where the Word of God is not mentioned anymore, and it doesn't mean anything to us anymore. And there's no place for us to turn, and we're hungry, and we're alone. There's no fun here anymore. The change has not worked. We've turned from our Father to do it all by ourselves, and we must admit that. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard or have you read, but let me, let me quote it to you again because I, I really, this really broke my heart when I heard this. And, of course, we know that New York City has been the hardest hit 
Uh, New York State is hard hit, but it's because of New York City. And I feel sorry for those people up there and all of those people that are having to work and all of those people that are having to do everything that they're doing. But they noticed that the curve was beginning to flatten in New York. And Governor Cuomo had a, a press conference. And during that press conference, he was talking about the flattening of the curve. And here's what he said. God did not do this. Faith did not do this. Destiny did not do this. A lot of pain and suffering did this. Isn't that sad? In other words, and I understand, he, he's saying, well, our nurses and doctors, but he's also talking about himself. God didn't do this. Well, who gave those people the knowledge to be a nurse and a doctor? Who called those people to be there? Who put those people there? Who put them in that place for this particular time? Who put us where we are? Only God. You can read it in Deuteronomy chapter 8. I'd read it to you, but if I turn my Bible, everything's going to blow. Read Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 13 through 17. Moses said, don't you forget, it is God that gave you this. God that gave all of this to you. It is God that's going to bring us through this. But he's going to get the glory for it. And only God's people living in the joy and the grace of God, walking in this land, in our communities, sharing Christ and letting them know that God is on his throne, that God is alive, that God is at work. Then God will get the glory. Then God will hear our prayer. Then God will heal our land. But we've got to admit it belongs to him. If we're in the wrong place, we've got to move out of that place and come back to God. You see, God is ready for us to admit we need Him. That's what this is all about. The Father remains in His place. He's sheltered there. And He wants us to understand we need Him. Psalms 46.1, many of you read that daily. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. Psalm 61.3, talks about God being our shelter. Proverbs 14, 26, and 18, 10 talk about God being our home and our shelter. Isaiah 25, 4 talks about God being our shelter. All of these things, beloved, teach us that God is the place where we need to be. We've distanced ourselves and we seek shelter in empty places, places that we can't find, places that we don't know. And what do we do? We make an excuse. We excuse ourselves. Everything becomes empty, and we make an excuse. Hebrews 10.25. Hebrews 10.25 says that you and I are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Don't forsake being together with the people of God. And why? He says we are to encourage them. We are to encourage each other. That's why I'm, I'm waiting so desperately for us to get back together so that we can be an, occur, an encouragement to one another and be there until the end day comes, is what he says in Hebrews. Now, folks, I want you to understand. He says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. That word forsake in the Scripture means to abandon. He said, don't abandon coming together and worshiping God with your brothers and sisters in Christ. We are to love them. We are to stand fast in them. We are to hold them and encourage them. And that's just exactly what happens to us. We've sheltered in the wrong place. We've distanced ourselves spiritually from God. But one other thing I want to mention to you, and then we'll close. They told us we got to wash our hands. My hands are getting cracked and dried, and so are yours. I understand. But, you know, sometimes I think we're washing with the wrong soap. We're trying to do it. We're trying to do this all ourselves, and we can't do this without God. And you see, what's happening is we've been using soap that lathers, but it doesn't clean. It doesn't kill germs. It may lather up real good, but it ha doesn't have what's necessary to clean us up and to take away those things that are harming us. Verse 17 is a great turning point. When the son said, and when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's house have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Listen, beloved. It's time for us to rise up. 
awaken and realize our Father is waiting at home for us. Don't go to the wrong place. And we can't use the soap that we have found in all these other places because it's not going to do anything. Because you see that soap in the empty places, the far places. Only thing that that soap does for us is that it makes our hands wet. But it doesn't give us any peace, doesn't give us assurance, doesn't give us salvation, doesn't give us hope. It can only bring fear. And thus we've got to turn ourselves back to a soap that makes us realize the truth of God. Don't distance ourselves so far away that God can't be glorified or shelter ourselves away from God. What we need is a soap that brings us to repentance. We need a soap that is going to allow us not to wallow in ourselves and make up every excuse that we can and blame our infirmities and, and the things that we're dealing with on why we just can't get up and come to church, why we can't get up and do this. We can't do that, folks. The only soap that we have is when this young man came back and his father saw him coming over the hill and his father ran to him and he grabbed him and he kissed him. And he said to the servants, he said, This is my son that was dead, and he's alive. You bring out the bath water, and you give him the best of soap. You give him the clothes to wear, and the rings to wear, and shoes to wear. Friend, it is only God that can cleanse us, and only God that can, uh, can clothe us, and only God that can meet every need of our life. He did it for that son. He can do it for us. The only cleansing that we have is in the precious blood of the Lamb. Only Jesus can bring us that cleansing. We're using the wrong soap. We're sheltering in the wrong place. We're distancing spiritually too far. Our spiritual lives, my friend, need to change. And let's not go back to normal. Just as this young son came back with his hat in his hand, as we say, and he repented, we need to repent. Father, I've sinned against you and against heaven. I'm no more, long, no more long worthy to be called your son. Make me a hired servant. And God said, no, you're my son. Beloved, if we come back to him, he'll bring us back into the family because we're his son. I think this is part of what's going on today. And I think it's for me and you to realize our need, our need for a Savior, our need to be in the presence of Almighty God. As we've wandered looking for something else, let's get back to God. Let's get back to where we belong. Let's don't go to some other place in shelter. Let's use the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse us as we confess our sin. And we confess we need him. Only then will God hear from heaven and heal our lands. It's up to me and you. You can make the difference, and so can I. Let's pray together. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed right where you are, you know and I know in my own heart, and folks, I've been repenting because I know I've distanced myself and I've, I've been sheltering wrong and I haven't washed as I should. And I've asked God to forgive me. And I pray today that, dear Christian friend, that you would ask God to forgive you, that you would realize, yes, I'm guilty too, that you would understand it's, it's not just a few, it's all of us. And God is wanting his people to return back. Would you confess your sin? Would you daily confess? Would you daily put your trust in him? Would you daily say, Lord, I'm willing to be where you want me to be, and I'm going to serve you with everything that I have? Would you turn yourself back to him? Let God heal you, and God heal your land. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, would you open your heart right now where you are? You've never invited him in. And I want to pray a prayer to ask you to invite Jesus in your heart. You pray with me this prayer. Dear Father, I know that I'm a lost sinner. I believe Jesus Christ died for me, and I believe he rose again. By faith, Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me of all of my sin. Save me, Lord. Be the Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving my soul. If you pray that prayer, I want you to give me a call. Let me know. Let me talk with you further. Let me know that, that you're out there and that you want uh, Christ to, to change your life. If you're out there, Christian, and you're listening, would you begin? Would I begin? Would we all begin? 
and turn ourselves back to God. Let's don't get too far away. Let's get to the right shelter. Let's clean ourselves up. Let's seek God. Let's make things a new normal. And that is God on his throne, Jesus as our Savior, the gospel to be preached, witnessing to be done, a word to be read, prayers to be prayed. Thank you, Father, for all that are listening today. Thank you for how you've spoken to our hearts. Father, I pray that you bless every family that's represented here. I pray that you give them safety home. I pray that you protect us, Father, from this virus. And, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would heal our land. Take this virus away. And, Lord, may we shout from the housetops, God did it. God did it. Lord, let your name be known throughout this nation and around this world. And may we be the ones that shout it to the rooftops. Lord, give us victory. Give us boldness. Father, give us peace. Give us assurance. Put a smile on our face and joy in our hearts. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, folks. Thank you for being here. We love you in the Lord. If you have your offering, hand it to one of these guys. They'll be glad to take it. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday.